Hi, I'm Sebastian Coutillo, and you're listening to Epicenter, the podcast where we interview crypto founders, builders, and thought leaders. If you can't tell by the sound of my voice, this is the day after ETHCC. Um, it was an amazing conference. And uh, one of the things that uh, I've heard a lot from people and was certainly my feeling was that it was it was great to connect with everybody again. The last conference, the last ECC uh, was just before all the lockdowns happened in early March of 2020. And for a lot of people in the space, you know, I think we had mostly seen each other on Zoom calls and to, to be able to, you know, see each other again, I think was uh, one of the things that people loved the most about this conference. Of course, you know, there was um, many great talks and, uh, and, and panels and, and, you know, the workshops and everything. But you know, getting to see everybody again was, I think, a major highlight here this week. Um, I want to congratulate uh, the uh, Ethereum France team for putting on this event. Given all the restrictions and, you know, we're still in the pandemic, it was a really amazing feat to be able to put this on. Um, and you know, bring in you know, over a thousand people in Paris. There were, uh, uh, you, we, we couldn't count the number of side events. Uh, that's how big this conference was because a lot of people just couldn't get in given the restrictions. So you know, it, it sort of overflowed into all these side events. So it was great, and I'm really looking forward to uh, next year's conference. Today we've got a sort of panel discussion uh, with Om Souriant, the CEO of Kaiko, Jérôme de Tichet, the president of Ethereum France, and Mounir Ben Shimled, uh, CEO and founder of Paraswap. And you know we just uh, talked about the conference and you know sort of like get their feeling on how things went and you know the ecosystem, how it's evolving, and we talked about the future as well. So it was a lot of fun, and I hope you'll enjoy it. If you're listening to this on the audio version of the podcast, we recorded this in the ECC uh, podcast studio, and so there's like cameras and everything. So we, you know, it's also on YouTube if you want to watch the video. Uh, it's pretty cool. Before we go to the interview, though, I'd like to tell you about our sponsors for this week's episode. And Paraswap is a sponsor this week. So you, with Paraswap, you can beat the market price every single block. It's fast and highly liquid, and they've just integrated with Ledger. So if you're using a Ledger device like me, uh, you can now swap directly in the Ledger Live app. So it makes it really easy to do swaps without having to like connect your Ledger to you know your browser and everything. So you know check it out if you're using Ledger and go to paraswap.io uh, to learn more. And Chorus One, you know, if you have crypto assets that are sitting idly in your wallet, you, know, you could start earning rewards and contributing to network security by staking with Chorus One. Uh, Chorus One is a staking provider with over a billion dollars in assets in over 25 decentralized networks, including Solana, Cosmos, and Ethereum. If you're interested in running your own branded node, uh, they have a white label node as a service offering that leverages Chorus One's um, highly available and proven infrastructure, enabling you to participate directly in decentralized networks. So head over to Chorus.one to start your staking journey. And with that, here's my conversation with Mounir Ben Chimled, Jérôme de Tichet, and Ambre Soubillon. So I'm here with uh, Munir Benjimled, founder and CEO of Paraswap, Jean de Tichet, uh, president of Ethereum France and organizer of this fine conference, and uh, Am Soubillon, who's CEO of Kaiko, uh, my three compatriots, uh, may I say. Uh, so thanks for joining me today on this little roundtable as we find ourselves at the end of the conference. Uh, everyone's a little tired, I think, but uh, I think we'll get through it and um, have, a, have a cool conversation. So yeah, thanks for joining me. Anytime. Um, so who, who went to the rave last night? I did. You did? I was there, yeah. I didn't. I saved my energy for today okay. and tonight. Yeah, yeah, I didn't go. I, I, I also wanted to save my energy for, the, for tonight. And uh, on the rooftop of EFM, it's going to be quite cool, I think. It was um, an amazing lineup. I want to say congratulations to Jave for organizing this. Like We had the whole Headbanger crew plus, uh, plus Breakboat yeah. plus Boys Noise. It reminded me of my... 20s, like 10 years ago when we were going to clubs in Paris, it was like this was the label to follow and like yeah. boom, suddenly reunited. Yeah. Crypto it. makes all your dreams come true. Oh, wow. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't have dreamt a better, uh, a better party, except that I had to work on the next day, so yeah. I didn't really party a lot. But and What's amazing is that this could actually even take place given the, given the yeah. context and everything. And so I think that's pretty cool. It, like it, it ended up lining up quite well, I think, yeah. like with the, the measures and everything and things seem to have gone quite smoothly. Um, so yeah, I mean, let, let's, um, I, there's a few things I want to talk about. I'd like to talk about, you know, of course the conference, but also like kind of looking at the ecosystem since, uh, since, well, since we last chatted last year and we also talked last year. Yeah. 
we we didn't talk last year, but I think like your perspective on the DeFi side would be interest would be interesting. Um, you know, last year the name of this panel was uh, Flash Loans and Elbow Bumps. <laughs> <laughs> um, Elbow Bumps are still here. Yeah. Uh, fist bumps too. Fist bumps too. Now we have fist bumps. We've upgraded no, the nobody, fist bumps. Nobody does the feet bump anymore. No. It's not a thing. But we, uh, but, uh, you know, in, in terms of like, w what are your takes on how the, how the Ethereum space has evolved in the last year? And like, do you think that the pandemic had a very sort of like specific, like specific ways in which it affected the Ethereum ecosystem? And like, what are your thoughts on like how things have grown? Why? Yeah. Left to right. <laughs> left your to start. Right. Yeah. Le let's start. Um, yeah. I think it's evolved a lot in terms of traction, in terms of uh, the category of users. Uh, a year ago, uh, we were mostly, it was mostly driven by what you call DeFi degens or power users who are using DeFi. And right now we start to see much more retail using, uh, using Ethereum. And I think part of that is due to side chains like Polygon, and BSC that have seen a big traction. And a year ago, if you would tell, ask me if uh, Polygon or, Cy or, or BSC would succeed, I would say definitely not. But that was my, one of the, my biggest surprises. But it, they definitely attracted new categories of users that we can see on any DEX, and including Parasol. Yeah, and, and that's probably also catalyzed by the fact that the market went up. So suddenly the, the, the focus on the blockchain space went crazy. Um, and from the overall ambience that we uh, that I kind of felt in the in the conference is a a, a, a lot of confidence. People feel confident, happy that uh, we had market validation that what we were building was good. Uh, also traction in terms of users, and that's a, that's a, a positive, very positive feedback loop that uh, we can feel in the in the community right now. And uh, from my perspective, uh, so I address a B2B audience with Kaiko, so we work with institutions in the space. And for me, 2020 was really the year of institutional adoption and something that I've been hoping for very intensely, which is institution obviously still focusing on Bitcoin, but really trying for the first time to give uh, Ethereum the attention it deserves. And obviously, it kind of starts with the launch of derivative products on Ethereum. It's not necessarily the way you would want to see institutions adopting the space, but at least it's not like Bitcoin or, uh, Bitcoin or nothing. Now Ethereum is definitely in the spotlight. We're starting to see um, regulated entities and capital markets kind of giants look very seriously at Ethereum, not just from a price speculating, like let's try this new asset class standpoint, but also from a how can we use this thing? How can we build industrial applications on top of this thing? And I find that super interesting and it really came out of 2020. I like uh, what you see when you say, well, it's institutional uh, acquisition. And uh, from my perspective, Bitcoin is the gateway drug. So you look at this and like, well, cool, now I have Bitcoin. So some, sometimes because your bank and your private bank sector will tell you like, hey, we really need to have Bitcoin because all of my clients, they want to have Bitcoin. Okay, let's do it. Let's have some Bitcoin, have some custody of Bitcoin. And companies in the field, just like some of our sponsors, Ledger, are providing a, a, a B2B custody solution. And they, so, they see traction on this. And when they end up having Bitcoin on their account, they're like, well, what can I do with this? And now you have companies like Aave, we have launched Aave Pro and saying, well, you know, you can have a yield on your Bitcoin if you wrap it into wrap Bitcoin and deposit on Aave. And suddenly they kind of feel like, okay, it's just not a, a dead cat sitting on my account. It's something that they can actually lend, that they can actually apply some derivatives, that come some financial primitives that I'm either aware of or that are like a little bit familiar and after hearing again and again that you can use Paraswap, that you can use Uniswap, that you can use SushiSwap, that you can use liquidity and so on, they, they kind of get to this. I, I would caveat that institutions, I don't think they're yet kind of trading on Uniswap or going through mm. Paraswap for executing trades, but at least they're looking at it and they know what, mm. what it means kind of. That's the major shift is that they are considering now using those technologies. That I think this, maybe you know better, they still see them as technologies and maybe they're not looking to trade on DeFi, but maybe use these technologies in their context. And I think that would be a blessing actually for the space, right? It's not just like, honestly, if we have institutions buying ETH, that's great, it you know, drives the price up, good. But what is really interesting is understanding that blockchain and Ethereum in particular as a technology can be used to actually implement financial contract, implement financial services. And it's not about just trading ETH, it's about building on Ethereum, just like all of us here are building on Ethereum, right? Hmm. I, I like this um, 
this sort of uh, dichotomy between like the institutional and the you know, more um, you know end user side of things. Uh, like since since uh, this la the last conference, you know, there was of course like DeFi summer, and there's like all this kind of degen activity. Uh, just before we had this talk, I was speaking with Italic. That episode will be out next week on Epicenter. Uh, and one of, the, one of the things we talked about was what he discussed during his talk was this, uh, you know, where he's, I don't want to, maybe not lamented, but, you know, he was somewhat cautious about, um, you know, the fact that, like, Ethereum has become a platform for financial uh, instruments and you have, like, layers upon layers upon layers of derivatives and at some point, you know, the thing can just collapse. And... I, 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 this resonates with me because I'm, you know, I, I, I sort of think that the entire world right now is like focused on prices and, you know, this like yeah. kind of idea of financial nihilism. And I, I hope that, you know, that there will be like actual, uh, you know, utility built on Ethereum. But at, at the moment, it seems like the things are going full finance and like, and but, you know. but there's finance on finance, right? There's finance kind of degen. I agree, like super leveraged position on like you create value that literally doesn't exist. Like there's yeah. not enough ETH to fulfill all of the derivatives contract that have been issued. That's kind of, you know, literally taking the bad things of traditional finance and applying, putting that on Ethereum, which is kind of, you know, a shame. However, there's incredible with things like that, a, a huge multiplier. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. But, but I mean, it's, it's like, you know, the subprime crisis is a very good example of like the like things that can happen when you keep embedding and wrapping too many things into too many things and like you lose track of what was inside in the first place. Uh, however, I'm also kind of a pro like uh, I think it's important to realize that there are good things in traditional finance and that we should think about bringing that on chain. I was talking to a guy who was building credit reputation, credit kind of rating, credit scoring on chain to assign credit scoring to wallets so that you don't need to give your ID as long as your wallet is reputable or deemed reputable, you can participate in two different types of on-chain applications. And and that's why like it's not just about finance in this, you know, in terms of APYs and all of that. It's also about having industrial applications, having real life use cases. And they could be financial. I mean it's what, what, what's wrong with having everyone and their mothers selling tokens to each other's <laughs> I just it's just been a new thing. And you're, to you're too smart to say <laughs> to say things like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I anyway I agree to say I, I I didn't hear Vitalik's interview, but yeah I I completely uh, copy that. Like, uh, there's there's a tendency to create new uh, tokens with a, the name of a f of any elements and and say hey this is the cucumber token and now uh, bring all your things and I'm going to give away so cucumber and then the previous one sell to the previous one and so yeah there, there there is a tendency to do that and to print super high APY and uh, and trying to bring people but on the plus side right having great reputation uh, it should be super cool also from a VC perspective because we see like dude, I mean you you better place to to talk about this but. Uh, uh, when you see EdVC last year, and you were at EdVC last year as uh, someone looking for funding, um, the, the, cr the VC crowd has evolved as well. Like, it, how many how many VC was there were there last year? We had like 27, and this year we had about 50. Yeah, was, so yeah. like dub doubled, right? And, and we had huge, like, awesome VCs this year. We also had amazing VCs last year, but so like... So just now, eat VC is a sort of sidetrack that's uh, yeah. organized with Kaiko and... and it's a, yeah, County, exactly. Uh, and it really emanated... From, yeah, and it emanated from when we raised Kaiko Seed. There was such a disconnect between, like, traditional fintech VCs and the blockchain founders. Uh, that we thought it's good to just break that ice and get fintech VCs just more into the Ethereum ecosystem. And I wanted to do that thing inside at CC because they needed to see the energy, the intelligence, the camaraderie that there is in that ecosystem and understand that if they see a founder that kind of doesn't know how to play the VC game or the VC pitch, whatever, but there is a different form of intelligence that I adore in this ecosystem. So bring us the credit score, like tell us like this founder is uh, worth nine out of 10 or this one is worth eight out of 10. And uh, tell the VCs like, well, look, uh, this is super credit score team, and it should it should have uh, more money because uh, what I hear, what I heard from VC this year is that, well, okay, this is complex, this is interesting, or we don't really know what the market is, but we will do a team play, and then okay, let's try to get validation yeah. about uh, early stage. Early stage VC is a founder's bet, and the founder's bet in an ecosystem where you don't necessarily understand the tech, and the founders are inherently not your traditional kind of you know fresh out of whatever college knowing the VC game type founder, it's it's harder for them to navigate. So, uh, my experience of pitching last year in a VC and meeting those VCs in a different context when we're not pitching, uh, like uh, raising yeah. right now, 
I saw big shifts in their approach. Last year, I felt like uh, traditional VCs who are not really in crypto uh, were kind of in a discovery phase, like yeah. trying to understand and uh, careful a little bit on what has to be done. And only a few months later, and maybe it coincides with DeFi summer, uh, at some some extent. Uh, right now, they built a full teams and they have a very deep understanding of what is DeFi and what is decentralization and so on. And they are now ready to deploy significant capital. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about tens of millions of dollars that is ready to be deployed right now. They're like looking for entrepreneurs. So I think maybe EDVC is one of the biggest contributors to this shift in fintech. Uh, yeah, I'm serious. I mean, I talked to them Thanks. and many <laughs> told me this. Yeah, I saw you in EDVC at that time. Didn't really, uh, we, it was still new for us and we needed more time to understand this thing. And right now they are like investing in DeFi protocols and mm -hmm. That's a good, that's a great thing. Uh, we're even starting to see traditional equity VCs that are kind of, you know, now building token funds, which sounded impossible a year ago. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, how, um, I mean, here in France, we have the BPI France, which is the sort of sovereign fund. Uh, I know that they're like quite involved uh, in the, in the yeah, they were big, crypto big, space. Yeah, they, they were big supporters this year, uh, very present. They've done kind of uh, giant leaps into understanding the space and getting to know the space. I think it's, they're still taking their time to actually deploy capital, but at least they're really now very much willing. Yeah, and supporting. Yeah, very supportive. They're very hi highly supportive, yeah. Many uh, VCs also thanks to them, to their encouragement that they are able to invest. And they invest, I think, in some venture capital. Yeah, they invested in, in White Star. In capital. White Star, yeah. Recently. White Star. And is so basically, White Star has a mandate to invest in French blockchain yeah. startups uh, using kind of also that extra fuel from BP. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So one one thing that I, I really want to talk about, since since uh, I'm here with uh, you know the, the creme de la creme of the French ecosystem, <laughs> is uh, how the French ecosystem has grown, um, and specifically the DeFi ecosystem. Um, I think like Paraswap is like one of the important players there. But you know like, like last year, like two years ago, you know there were a lot of crypto startups in France, but you know you had like Ledger and a lot of like smaller ones, and and not so much uh, happening in DeFi. But like in the last few months even like we've just seen like tons of really high quality DeFi products coming um, out of the French ecosystem and like teams based in France starting in companies in France um, and um, and like gaining traction and you know exciting gathering excitement around their projects like where do you think this is coming from and uh, you know are, are we gonna start seeing like a, a sort of <laughs> shift towards more DeFi projects in France um, well we can only uh Assume that uh, Ethereum France is doing good, <laughs> 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 trying to promote the fact that uh, Paris is a, a good place on the map to, uh, to 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 see things happening on Ethereum, um, and also it's uh, like for, I, I think in the financial space, in the financial industry, the, the the French individuals have a good reputation because they do math and abstraction to a certain extent, and uh, they like being a quant, like being a trader or whatever. Um, and now they are applying their uh, brain juice to doing crypto stuff. Um, I'm very happy to see uh, AP Wine here as a, as a sponsor behind us, uh, a very young company of uh, two young out of school uh, that just build a way to separate yield from a token and retokenize it and doing cool derivatives of them. <laughs> yep, we just talked about it, but the, the approach is very, 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 very uh, smart. I, I love it. And uh, one of the things that uh, I love also is Mangrove, a project by academics in France from... Yeah, uh, super interesting project. Yeah, that uh, tried to uh, try to address one of the problems we have with uh, automated market maker and other DeFi projects where it's highly capital uh, in, in inefficient and uh, yeah they're tackling this problem with a very nice approach as well so it's 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 great it's great to see happening and uh, I think also that the fact that we have a background of uh, doing lots of public goods doing lots of research deep research um, and applying this to crypto is um, it's only starting to happen so very very eager to see what and I think is. a lot of these projects uh, if you look at the founders of I think many of them are probably like former Consensus uh, France uh, people that worked at Consensus France, even though, <laughs> even though Consensus France doesn't really, I mean, I think they probably have a few people still, but um, th I think that was like a really good incubator incubator for creating uh, you know, much of what's happening now in the French ecosystem. Well, I think it's like a network effect. So you, you need to have one project that's going to attract another one. And once you reach a critical mass, then you create an ecosystem. 
And I think well, Ethereum friends contributed a lot. We were also organizing DeFi friends, which we were very surprised to see how much traction and that was in 2019, in the middle of the bear markets. And we had like uh, 100 people in a small room come in to listen to DeFi. So that was also early signs that there is something happening. And now we see the results of this top quality project that we've seen. And I think we're going to see more in the near term. I think something something very beautiful about the Ethereum ecosystem in general, maybe in France in particular, because I just see it more, is that in bear markets, people get their head together and try to think kind of proactively around how they're going to build things versus kind of just being down and depressed. And why is that? It's just because Ethereum offers tools that enables you to build, right? Versus, I guess, the biggest divide would be Bitcoin Ethereum, where, well, Bitcoin drops, you know, you're kind of like looking at your screen and you can't do anything about it. <laughs> With Ethereum, you can actually think, hey, you know, the ecosystem needs uh, an ex a DEX aggregator. The ecosystem needs a fiat on-ramp. You know, there's so many things that you can do to enable growth and application and collaboration between companies. And this is done thanks to organization like Ethereum France or like bringing people together so that intelligence kind of is shared. Uh, and and yeah, education for sure. Like, next, next time the good. price drop, we'll spend some time breeding some Axie Infinity and uh, <laughs> playing some games. <laughs> um, you know, we, we couldn't uh, have a, a, an Ethereum uh, ETC panel without talking about uh, NFTs and uh, what's been happening in the NFT space in the last uh, few months. And I'm glad you're here because you're building a product that very much you know um, uses NFTs. Um, for, do 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 you guys think that you know what, what's the what's the real utility to come out of that um, of that space? And you know we were talking earlier with with uh, with Sunny Metallic, and you know I think NFT space is probably not the right way. It's like there are several sort of use cases. So like there's the art use case, there's the collectibles use case, there's like gaming, um, and you know there's like finance kind of intermingled with all of that, you know, kind of interwoven into all of the, all of these use cases. Uh, what is the, like, what is the, you think the use case that will be, that will kind of pop out of this as, as the, as the most like widely used? Um, well, um, well, where, where to start? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> from the beginning. So this year we had a, a hard exhibit uh, from NFT artist, uh, another bad name, I'm an NFT artist. Uh, well, basically an artist that put a representation of their digital art into the blockchain, so as a form of NFT. Um, and I think we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg on this, because we still have to see artists trying to uh, use the blockchain medium to make them their art evolve. Uh, we had um, uh, one speaker in 2018 that came again and again to HCC, which is Kevin Abosh, a photographer that is experimenting with the blockchain with uh, um, work like uh, Y Lombo or, or the This Is A Bank or his collaboration with Ai Weiwei on using blockchain to do new kinds of arts. Um, so that's super exciting to see. And we are only seeing the beginning of this. I think maybe the art space will be super active on doing blockchain stuff pretty soon. Now, when it comes to blockchain, I'm, I'm a deep believer of having gaming as a way to onboard people into blockchain because it gives them a, a reason to actually try to install a wallet. And if they don't succeed on trying to install a wallet, having another game pushing a wallet to them in another way. And suddenly solving the problem that you are actually playing when you are doing a video game or you are, you are enjoying a video game. And at some point, the thing that you earn in the video game or the thing that represents your character or the thing that your character has, you want to give them value. You want to have something outside of the game or eventually have the thing that you have in the game being uh, usable in another game. Um, and that's what NFT is bringing to, the, bringing to the table. And now, what can you do with this? Well, we can use the blockchain to do pairing of players. So instead of doing everybody to a server and play Fortnite, Eventually, you can play on the blockchain, doing everybody together on a smart contract and have peer-to-peer -peer rather than multiplayer, for example. And using the blockchain as a way to uh, run a blockchain game engine uh, can be something very exciting as well. So I'm really excited to see where this is going. Yeah, and it's, it's also it's also kind of encouraging to see that, like in France, we have like Sorare, who's you know like one of the probably the, the biggest like NFT issuer, uh, and also like Comet is. And sandbox as well, yeah. 
No, it's kind of cool to see like this oh, kind of gaming, to... this kind of gaming uh, ecosystem, like French gaming ecosystem, also uh, move into the blockchain space. Yeah, we have a big tradition in France to be known for finance, but also known for video games. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's only natural it's to see, yeah. and uh, very happy that uh, it applies to blockchain. Um, what, uh, in terms of everything that you've seen here this year, like, you know, uh, what are you most hopeful uh, in terms of like? technology advancements uh, or uh, like new types of applications uh, being built on Ethereum? Like, what will we look back on next year and be like, oh, that was the thing that, you know, kind of blew up in, in 2021? It is especially scaling solutions. Uh, I think there was a proof of concept with sidechains uh, that proved there is a big need and it works. Uh, when we put more, I would say, resources and make this thing uh, cheaper and faster, it definitely works. It uh, works, sorry. And right now we're entering the phase of layer twos, like effective layer twos, not independent side chains. Mm -hmm. And I think this will bring new possibilities. Like if we come back to finance, things like high frequency trading, uh, that is not possible uh, right now. Today it's gonna be it's gonna be possible. And I think the challenge right now is. We are breaking what we know as composability in, in DeFi, and, but we're entering this new phase, so new challenges are gonna come in order to solve what we just broke, and, but that's gonna take DeFi and maybe other, other use cases to next stages, and maybe we will start getting closer to CeFi or TradeFi, um, but I think I think you you, you know you know better on like how to take uh, leverage with risk and how to 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 use the derivatives in order to get, have best execution. And I think DeFi would look like that in the future. It's gonna be maybe better, maybe not. I'm I'm not sure. I mean, but yeah, those are the new challenges that are coming with those new scaling solutions. In my opinion. I'm not sure I'm for like high frequency trading on the blockchain. It, it suits you because it so generates feeds on, feeds on par. So. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, but in general, I, I, I'm, you know, again, I'm B2B, so I'm very close to what's going on on the enterprise institutions, capital market side. Very, very excited about like Société Générale Forge against like French version of kind of one of those institutions looking at using Ethereum in order to implement equity derivatives, traditional equity derivatives. So they're looking at uh, kind of European indices uh, derivatives that could be living on Ethereum, where obviously we could play the role of bringing the settlement data on chain. So what I'm looking at from, I guess, a more infrastructure perspective would be those on-ramp, off-ramps, bridging traditional finance and on-chain finance from a, from my perspective, from a data perspective, but it could be custody, it could be reputation. Uh, I think oracles are going to be extremely important in the future, you know, having reliable information that is brought from outside the blockchain onto the blockchain, enabling uh, the implementation and, and, and delivery of contracts that are tied to instruments that live outside of the blockchain. Uh, if you think about it, most financial contracts are kind of signed on a piece of paper or DocuSign or whatever, and they represent code. And if you think about it, code, like a legal agreement is, is code. You define functions and then you implement functions, et cetera. So if you can translate a lot of those financial contracts or whatever type of contracts into code, what you need are the inputs. And those inputs will be provided by oracles uh, we, you know, we believe this is going to be very important in the future. Also, the enforcement of those agreements can be automatic. Exactly. No, that's the purpose of putting it into a smart contract. Is like automation of a legal agreement uh, that can represent any type of contract. Absolutely. Yeah. But what struck me this year is the humongous amount of DeFi sub DeFi application that we had on the call for speaker. So when we were reviewing it, we were lucky to have lots of talks that were kind of similar. So we could have like do different talks and do a selection uh, and keep it keep the, the DeFi track quite small, even if it was like 30% or 40% of the whole conference. And at the same time, literally little to no Ethereum 2 talks. Uh, so maybe it means that Ethereum 2 is on track and we are just like, okay, let's let's let it come <laughs> and uh, and hopefully everything will be will be good. Uh, and 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 it feels like Ethereum 2 is a, a little bit too far away or too virtual, like not, not concrete yet. Hence maybe why we have uh, all of those layer two solutions or side chains that are uh, thriving right now. Mm. Um, but in, in the end, we will need both uh, for yeah. sure. Uh, you have, uh, if you 
take for example, let's, let's say let's say we do proof of stake tomorrow, and uh, all the chains runs like three times faster than uh, what Ethereum mainnet is doing right now, uh, and we have 64 chains. Well, that's three times 64 more blocks. So like lots of blocks. Yay! Mm. <laughs> maybe maybe the prevalence of uh, you know of scaling solutions and like layer twos is is taking the pressure off a little bit off of like yeah. the ETH two stuff because people the, can actually definitely, like, build definitely. things. And but let's say we have a uh, exponential adoption because suddenly like hey we are mature for this market we are mature to go retail and uh, we have lots of video games we have lots of dexes we have lots of DeFi projects uh, like i'm um i know the metrics from cometh for example we've been live for six months on polygon and we did uh, eight million transaction in six months uh eight million transaction of an average of one million gas per transaction because we execute lots of things inside the blockchain so that's uh well Eight, 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 eight trillion gas consumed. That, that's just huge. Like we need it in layer two solutions on top of the side chain or layer two solution on top of the of the of the shards that you are deployed in. Um, so what I liked a lot is the the talk about uh, zk EVM by Hermes and there are also people trying to go that that direction like Starkware and so on. So I'm very uh, very happy that uh, people are. Are, are, are already seeing the next step. Mm. What happens if uh, next year we have a successful video game, successful DeFi stuff, successful new things built on Ethereum, successful governance built on Ethereum, and we, are, we have to deliver that to one billion people, not only tens of million. Yeah, I think what, what, will be, what will be interesting to see is like how these different types of applications with very different uh, sort of platform needs will coexist. And yeah, we were also talking about this with, with, uh, with Sunny and Vitalik earlier, I said, you know that, uh, so I, I, you know, very close to the Cosmos community as well, and like the vision in the Cosmos community is that you have like application-specific chains, and so um, you know, which is what I think has enabled a lot of like non-financial applications to to exist. So you have like a chain that's yeah. like for uh, VPN, like a chain that's for like you know building like sort of cloud. Um, because there's like a, you know, for, so in the Ethereum space, the analogy is like you need, you know, things that are good for finance, things that might be good for gaming, things that might be good for, like, I don't know, minting NFTs or things like that. And, you know, perhaps that with, you know, uh, scaling solutions, we'll start to see like some sort of fragmentation in terms of the applications because like building a DeFi app and like building, you know, like a, a game uh, necessitates like much, like quite, quite different like technical infrastructure and, um, and, and scaling. Well, I kind of disagree with that. <laughs> Please continue. <laughs> no, I, I, no, I think it's a, it's a good approach from an engineering perspective. Oh yeah, we want to make dedicated chain with dedicated architecture and things. But the beauty of it is composability. Mm. Like, uh, how, yeah, I want to see I want to see a video game where you have an economy inside this video game represented by ERC twenty, ERC seven two one, and so on, and being able to have all the DeFi primitives to list those resources in game, so that. The, the economy of this video game can thrive with those primitives rather than have to go to another chain or have to, have to go to another shard. And maybe that can very well work without it, but I think we are, like we are, it's like, it's like having a, a, good, a, good, uh, a good thing to eat, but no sauce to pour on it. Like, why, why, would, you, why would you say like, hey, well, <laughs> no, I no think sauce. also that's one of the box or the proof of concept that uh, side chains like Polygon has proven is that you can have video games and they are interoperable with uh, financial assets. Uh, and at the end, I mean, you are creating a new virtual world that also has its economy, like uh, you can trade the uh, NFTs, for instance, and so on. And having composability makes things much, much easier. Uh, it doesn't mean that this fragmentation will, I mean, will make it impossible, but it just will make it challenging, and it's gonna take some time to, to fix. The only thing is how to manage this transition phase. I don't see, like, uh, there is no magic formula, but I think we're gonna have to live with both and wait until we find those solutions and battle test them, and how long this will take, maybe one or two years, maybe more, it's hard, hard to say. Mm, yeah, I feel like perhaps the this sort of fragmentation might come later when you have more real world things that are on the blockchain. It's like when you have like the equity for your house, for example, on the blockchain, uh, you know, perhaps it's not so useful to have like sitting, for, it's not so useful for that being sitting right next to like, you know, your, your, uh, your Shiba Inu NFTs or things like that. I'll counter that as well. I'm just, I'm just thinking, for example, like, uh, um, I just bought an apartment and we Congratulations. thanks and it was a loan that was collateralized by the actual house. So um, basically instead of having an insurance where if I die 
uh, the insurance pays the whatever is left of the loan. Here I have a crédit hypothécaire, so a collateral, a mortgage, a mortgage that it's is very rare in France. No, exactly. I also just bought a house and I don't exactly. Have a mortgage. <laughs> and and actually the mortgage is collateralized by the real estate. Yeah. And so in some way, if I have a representation of my ownership of my house on a blockchain, maybe I want to use that as collateral, mm. for example. So I, I obviously there could be some rare cases where you don't necessarily need the ability to have that kind of different economics. It's just like it's a shame to have a system that offers it and then not benefit it by putting it in a corner. I mean, wait, 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 wait. That's, that's awesome. That's a great idea. Like, uh, let's uh, let's have an NFT project where you 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 take a loan to buy the NFT, and uh, if you don't reimburse the loan, we take the NFT away. Yeah, the big problem here is the value, right? I mean, uh, use your so rare cards as collateral yeah, for your house. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the problem. The, so the, that's the huge problem with collateralized <laughs> loans in general is how do you monitor the loan to value and how do you pay margin calls, etc. And that's what you have when you borrow stable coins against crypto. You have those margin calls, etc. So the liquidity of the underlying asset is important. In the case of a house, they basically take a discount, and it's not a very volatile asset price. But if you start putting, you know, spaceships and Sorari cards, and <laughs> I'm not sure how I would trust <laughs> okay, <you're right laughs> the <my> solidity <laughs> of my collateral. <laughs> um, cool. So uh, what's 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 next for HCC? Uh, I mean, like the, the, I think this was oh. given the pandemic and. and given the context, I think it was like such a fa fabulous conference. I yeah, it, it was. It, it was a boon. Um, you know. Um, basically, you know, you've had two years of ETC during the pandemic, and I think it's like the two biggest ETCs uh, have been during the pandemic. We'll see if there's like a Google spreadsheet with like you know devariant infections uh, uh, that'll come out in the next few years. I might, I might actually, I was thinking of actually like creating the spreadsheet and like just putting it out there like <laughs> as a pinned tweet so people can start you know if there are infections they can at least uh, you know list them. Memories of first, first, huh? first COVID cluster, first the Delta cluster. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let, let's be proactive here because it's probably no, they, gonna happen. But yeah. After after the Delta cluster come the E cluster, so we call it the E for cluster. <laughs> this will be the best uh, best advertisement possible. Like uh, last year, I was joking, saying that we we kind of created the herd immunity of the community. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, so 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 yeah. Remember, what, what did you learn this year, and what what, what 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 are your plans for next year? Oh yeah, well well just just a little remark about last year because well, maybe people are watching us like whoa the, those careless people like holding conference in the middle of the pandemic. So SEC happened last year, the first week of March. And uh, the, the weekend before the HCC, there was the Salon de l'Agriculture, the agriculture uh, gathering, uh, with uh, 30,000 people going there. And the first day of HCC, we had our president, Macron, going to the theater, being interviewed, saying like, hey guys, just enjoy Paris, go out, live, live as it was normal, like we have things that are under control. By this time, we didn't know exactly what was coming. We were relying on the WHO, uh, recommendations and so on and and yeah, yeah this is this, this was crazy basically um and now we were thinking about how we're going to do it this year how we're going to be able to organize it or, or not uh we were thinking about doing it in march and then in then may and then june and then we said okay let's let's we have one bullet left let's go for july and if it doesn't happen in july like we'll see the the rules have changed during uh, during the preparation. Like the week before we were supposed to have HCC, we had uh, the president coming to uh, the the TV and say like, okay, so starting this day we were going to enforce this, which we had to enforce on the second day of yeah. the conference. It didn't change much. Uh, we didn't want it to enforce that initially uh, and stick at 1,000 people. We maybe could have had sold 3,000 tickets also. Uh, but yeah, we stick to that and uh, and everything went fine. So now the question for us is to say, well. Are we going to host the conference in March 2022? It's starting to get ready for this. Or are we going to aim for May, June, July? Maybe it was too hot for Paris this summer, and maybe a little bit earlier would be better. Um, and I people, I think, generally liked it. I, I got a lot of feedback from people said that they liked that it was in the summer. Yeah, yeah, and and we are very close with the the Berlin community, the German community in general, and we know that they were organizing a conference, DAPCON, and and everything around this uh, in in East Berlin uh, in August. So we don't want to 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 be in a position where we impose the composition, the, the competition, or we impose our agenda or, and so on. So we will synchronize with them to see what works best, or even if we can have one thing here and one thing there. Let's let's see what what could work. Um, and moreover, the big question for us is to know where, whether or not we are going to have a DEF CON this year, uh, whether or not it's going to happen this year in Bogota as, as planned in December. 
uh, and that's going to to be also a part of the the decision. Like if nothing happened in December and we cannot uh, party because we just moved to the next phase of Ethereum two, well maybe we should do something about it. Maybe we should have a half at CC or something. Okay. Well, um, hopefully we can have a full. Uh, we, instead of a half FCC, we can have a, a double FCC, <laughs> and we can have like three thousand people here at the at La Mutualité. <laughs> How much can we fit here? How many people? Tops. Uh, the place is incredible. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm not. I'm not entirely sure. I think. Uh, I think if every every room is filled of people and everything and everywhere, and it's, I think it's close to twelve thousand. Ah, okay. So we have room for for wow. growing in here. Yeah, but th I I don't know if if the yeah I don't know. Let's, uh, let's discuss that. <laughs> One thing that I'm happy about, and I, I, I didn't use it very much, but I'm very happy about this, the studio. Uh, um, because last year I had my little Rinky Dink podcast booth under the stairs, which was great. Um, but, I mean, this is, I think, such a great Im a great thing to offer uh, you know, media and, and podcasters is to have like a proper studio and... You know, hats off to you guys for doing that. We are two professional teams organizing a, well, sh shooting a documentary, uh, two different teams. And let's see what comes out of this. Yeah, yeah, that's right. There's going to be like maybe a Netflix documentary filmed at ETC. So that's pretty cool too. All right. Well, uh, it's late in the third day. I think everybody wants to go have a drink uh, on the on the rooftop at the next to the Sun. So um, we'll end it here and see you guys next year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.